Pablo, this presentation is going to give an example of how to hierarchically use transformations to move objects around. So in general, why do we want to hierarchically transform things around? Well, for instance, suppose we're simulating a moving object and it's got parts on it that are moving relative to the object itself. We want to have some transformations that will be represented by matrices that control the overall movement of the object. And then we'll have other transformations that control the parts on the object. So for instance, suppose we were animating a car, and the car is moving along a road, up and down hills perhaps, changing orientation and position. And on the car there's a steering wheel, and, uh, and wheels turning, and maybe the door is opening and closing, or something like that. So we want to have some transformations, which again will be represented by matrices that control the position of the car overall. And then other transformations, uh, also controlled by matrices, which give the position of, the, say, the steering wheel, or the wheels, or the car door, etc. So in this presentation, we'll just do a very simple example of this, just to get a first example of how transformations compose. Um, so the example is just going to be two F shapes. So I'm going to have two F shapes, and we want to draw them so as to share some code. So the F shapes, I want to render like the following. So here's the X axis. Here's the Y axis. And I'm going to think about, well, I'll just draw a line here of length L that makes angle theta with the x-axis, and two lines here, both of length R, that are right angles to the first line. And then we're going to put at the top of this first upper line of length R in F shape, and at the bottom of this other arm of length R in F shape here. Right, so, of course, and we want to be able to share code. We assume we've got a function that draws the F shape by drawing its vertices, and then we want to specify the transformations on the F that put the F twice, once in the, in the upper position and once in the lower position. So, just to mark this up a little bit more, if it's length R from here to here, this will be length R plus 1, right, because the the bottom half of the F shape has size 1. So let's work out, there's lots of ways to move an F. The first F starts out at the origin. There's lots of ways to move an F so as to get it from the origin in the standard position up to this one. Let's start with the upper F here then. So for the upper F, here's my X axis and my Y axis. And we're going to start off with the upper F Start it off in a little bit smaller to make space in standard position. And we want to think about how are we going to move this smaller f to be sitting up here in the position of the upper f. Well, there's lots of ways to do it, but I'm going to envision the following. We first move it upward. So it gets moved up. And the translation for this is t0 r plus 1. Why r plus 1? Because we start at the origin, and the origin moves up length r plus 1. So that's like this motion from here to here. And then we're going to take this f and push it out. Uh, we'll use t l0. And so when we push it out, the f will sit about here. All right? And so what's going on here is we've taken the... We started off with the f in the standard position, we translate it up, we translated it rightward, and so, and then we're going to take the whole thing, draw some red line, dotted red lines here, these match the red lines here, we're going to take the whole thing and rotate it up. So when we rotate it up, the picture is going to look, draw another set of axes here, the picture is going to look like that top f, so it's going to be and then the F is sitting here. And those three steps, this is a rotation by angle theta in the counterclockwise direction. So those three steps take the F in standard position and map it to the upper F. So how do we express this in terms of compositions? We thought of first moving up, then moving rightward, then rotating. So we write this as the transformation for the upper F
it's going to be, I'm going to write it from right to left, t0 r plus 1 composed with t l0 composed with r pi, or I'm sorry, r phi, r theta, composed with r theta. And why do we end up with them in this order here? Because we're thinking of this transformation applies to some f, so this applies, then this applies, then this applies, and that matches the order that I drew it on the board here. So we'll do a similar thing for the lower f, but more complex. And I'm going to set it up so that the lower f uses the r theta and the t l zero still, but the rest of it's going to be different. There's different options for how we do this, but let's try drawing the lower f. So the lower f, let me draw the x, y axes again, leaving more room down there. And we're going to, um, for the lower f, we start off with the f in the standard position. And as the very first step, we're going to think of rotating the lower f. So we're going to think of taking that f, and I'll just, I'll leave a little space there, but still at the origin actually. I'm going to hit it with a rotation of r pi. So r pi is a rotation of 180 degrees. Doesn't matter actually whether it's clockwise or counterclockwise because it's the same thing. Keeps the origin fixed and it flips the f around. These two bars, I drew them separately on the board, but they're actually the same bar. They're both lying on the y-axis. And then we think that's the first transformation on the f. And then we think of transforming that by sliding it down. So this is t0 negative r plus 1. And that takes the f and pushes it down to here. I'll put it back on the y-axis. Right, and so here's the point. Right here is the point. 0, negative r plus 1. That's in parentheses. Okay, now we're going to translate it out by translate it by, now it's as before, TL0, distance L in the x-axis direction, and the F ends up sitting about here. And so, of course, this is the coordinate L negative R plus 1 at the center of the F that used to be at the origin. And then we're going to think of taking that and rotating it up. I'll just draw this on the same thing because I have room now. So we think of We're going to take this and rotate it up so it's like like this. This is like L. This is like R. And the rotated F sits here, which is not quite drawn to scale, but supposed to match the F of the lower F as desired. And this is angle theta, right? So, so these transformations, rotation, translation, translation, rotation, give us what we want. So again, we do them, we write them in the opposite order. The transformation for the lower f is going to be, we have r pi, that's the rotation here, composed with t, 0, negative r plus 1, in parentheses, composed with t L0, composed with R theta. And so that matches the fact that we think of applying the, the transformations in the composition from right to left, and that matches the order that we use to transform the F around. So you'll notice here, and we're going to take advantage of this on the next board, that the first pair of of uh, transformations in the composition are the same for both the upper f and the lower f. We're going to take advantage of this by saying that we'll have a separate parameter theta and, and l that we can vary, and if we vary them in our code in just one place, it'll move both of the f's around at once. Uh, before I do that, let me mention there is an alternate transformation for the lower f. And there's a different way to transform the lower f. Um, and this illustrates the fact that 
rotations and translations do not uh, do not do, do not commute. And the alternative is we could think of first moving. The, well, in the first example, we rotated and then transformed down. We could instead push up and then rotate down. So what we could have done was let me just write the whole thing out. The r pi, as r theta is the same, t l zero is the same, and then we want to think about r pi composed with t zero positive r plus one. And this actually has the same effect as this. We just have changed the, interchanged the placement of a rotation and a translation, but when we did so, we had to change the translation amount to get the same effect. And again, what this does is we think of, we first translate up r plus one. We then, holding the origin fixed, we rotate, the f comes around, rotates around to be at the bottom position. So these have the same effect. The first one I gave rotated the f around the origin and then slid it down. The second one I gave translates the f up and then swings it around to be on the bottom. And it has the same effect. OK, so we're going to work with these two transformations here and show how this might be put together in a sort of pseudo OpenGL program of how you would structure such a program. We'll do that next on the next board. So now I'm going to give the example of how your, open, your OpenGL C++ code would be structured to implement these transformations. Now, it's not going to be real OpenGL code at all. I'm just going to use mathematical notation, but it's just going to give the structure of the code here. So I'll call this pseudocode, and you can see more of this in the textbook as well on the online, in the online PDF file. So the idea is the following. We have a series of matrices that we create and as we create them, we'll build these transformations, and, uh, and then uh, we'll draw the F with that matrix in effect. So we're going to start off with, so the code is going to be the following. The first line is you set M1 equal to the identity. And you can think of this as either the identity transformation or the identity matrix. And since we're working in R2, it would be a three by three matrix to represent the identity affine transformation. We set M1 then gets equal to itself composed with R theta. So we're thinking about composing with a rotation. So M1 is now equal to just the R theta part of this first thing here. We now further set M1 equal to, that should have been an M1 here, M1 composed with T sub L zero. So now we're composing with a translation. So we've M1 is the identity, then composed with R theta, composed with T L zero. So at this point, M1 is this part. And then we set M2, we're going to change the matrix name, to be M1 composed with T zero R plus one. So this makes M2 equal to this transformation here. And then we then we render f the f shape with m2 as the so-called model view matrix. So the model view matrix, you may recall from an earlier lecture, controls the placement of objects in space. The view matrix controls the way the viewer looks at it, the model view matrix controls the way objects are placed in space. So we're thinking of rendering the F. The F is specified when we do the rendering with the vertices around the origin. So the F hasn't been transformed yet. But then we specify also a model view matrix and that automatically, well not automatically, the vertex shader code transforms the vertices of F with the model view matrix to place it in the upper position. And this draws the, this gives the to render the upper F. So this renders the upper F. And then continuing our code here, we, we still have M1 equal to the product or, or the composition of these first two things. We're going to use it here again. So now I'll go to M3. Could we use matrices, but there's no need to. M3 will be M1. Remember, that's these the composition of these two things, composed with T zero, negative r plus one. 
and that gives the uh, M3 is now the composition of those first three things. We then set M3 to be M3 composed with R pi. So now M3 is all of these things. And then we render the F centered at the origin, but with M3 as the model of the matrix. And this uh, renders the, the lower F. Okay, and this is the general structure of how we do transformations in an OpenGL program. You may wonder why did we do such little small steps composed with R theta than composed with translation. Well, it's traditional to do this, and there's built in commands that let you do each of these things. So we'll typically do these on separate lines. Um, plus, it makes it easier to think about, perhaps, than to put everything together. Uh, so, what happens in a real OpenGL program that I haven't put on the board here? So, first of all, in an OpenGL program, uh, we don't deal with transformations in the abstract. We deal with transformations as matrices. So, transformations are matrices and they're that act on homogeneous coordinates. So if we're working in R2, which we are, we're usually working in R3, but if we were working in R2, we'd use a 3x3 three three matrix to represent affine transformations in homogeneous coordinates. If we're in R3, we'd use um, a 4x4 four four matrix. We'll talk about this soon to act on homogeneous coordinates in R3. But everything here is then a matrix. We have the identity matrix, M1 is a matrix, R theta is a matrix, and so forth. And then composition, as I wrote on the board here, is just matrix multiplication. So when we compose transformations, we'll do it by composing, by, by multiplying matrices together. Um, the matrices themselves get sent to the, so the matrices, or I should say the model view matrices, the model view matrices uh, get sent to the, to the shader program as what are known as uniform variables. So a uniform variable is a kind of global variable for a shader program that's available to all the shaders. And it typically, the value of the uniform variables changes slowly. We don't have a different uniform variable for each vertex. Instead, we're rendering a bunch of vertices, say, to form the F in our example here. And we have a single value for the model view matrix while we're rendering a bunch of vertices. The, 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 the vertex positions uh, like the vertices of the F, for instance, these are these are vertex attributes. So the these are the things that are stored in the VBO. Usually, the vertex buffer object, and so we have an array of vertex positions that are passed into the shader program as vertex attributes. Uh, and the shader program actually. It's the code you have to write if you write a shader program. You have to take the vertex positions and the model view matrix and actually multiply them together to get the position of the object in three space. You would also then multiply them by a, another matrix called the projection matrix or the view matrix to put it on the screen. Uh, again, that's a topic for yet another discussion. So that's everything for this presentation. Thank you very much.